Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and, uh, and welcome to the Boston Foundation. I'm uh, Paul Grogan, president of the foundation, and uh, we're pleased that this topic this morning has obviously stirred uh, great interest, not only by the size of the group here, that, but uh, its quality. Uh, I'd love to introduce a number of people, but there's so many uh, distinguished folks here that would, uh, that would take up most of the program. So uh, forgive me if I, if I uh, don't do that. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with the Boston Foundation, but for those who may be here, uh, for the first time, uh, the Boston Foundation is Greater Boston's uh, Community Foundation, um, a 100-year-old uh, charity with assets of approximately uh, $1 billion. We serve as a major funder of nonprofit organizations and work as a philanthropic partner with uh, area individuals and uh, uh, corporations. Uh, the Foundation is also a, a civic leader and convener. Understanding Boston is one of our core programs, a series of forums, educational events, and research sponsored uh, by the Foundation uh, with support from the Civic Leadership Fund and the Permanent Fund uh, for Boston. I'm very pleased to welcome you here this morning for this important conversation on the Common Core State Standards and the Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Career known as PARC. Uh, today, we're thrilled to be hosting Michael Cohen, the president of Achieve, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit education reform organization dedicated to working with states to raise academic standards and graduation requirements, improve assessments, and strengthen uh, accountability. Achieve was created in 1996 by a bipartisan group of governors and business leaders and helped develop the Common Core state standards. 26 states and the National Research Council asked Achieve to manage the process to write the next generation science standards. In the past, Achieve also served as the project manager for states in partnership for assessment of readiness for college and uh, careers or PARC. You've heard of the Common Core standards and PARC as looming seismic changes in the K through 12 uh, landscape. These new standards and assessments come obviously at a time of great change in our schools, our city, and our commonwealth. In a state whose primary natural resource is talent, we can't afford to graduate thousands of students every year who are not ready to, go, to succeed in college. Here in Boston, we've made great progress, yet still only half of the students who enroll a college, in college will earn an associate's or bachelor's degree within six years. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, in terms of the program, uh, uh, Michael Cohen from Achieve will follow me in a moment with an overview of the standards uh, and the park assessments to set the context. And then we'll ask two of our leading lights in education in uh, Massachusetts, uh, Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Ed Mitchell Chester and Commissioner of Higher Education Richard Freeland to offer uh, some comments about what they believe this will mean uh, for Massachusetts. And uh, in our uh, customary fashion, following those speakers, um, Elizabeth Pauley, our Senior Director for Education, will facilitate uh, a terrific uh, panel uh, discussion, and you will have an opportunity to interact with the panel and with uh, the commissioners, and we'll have everyone out of here by uh, 1030 as we, uh, as we always do. So to kick things off, let me introduce uh, 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 Michael Cohen, the president of Achieve, and, and really one of the authors uh, of the Common Core. He has deep experience in education policy, serving as the director of education policy at the National Governors Association, assistant secretary of elementary and secondary education, and special assistant uh, for education policy to President uh, Bill Clinton, among many impressive roles he has played in the course of his career. Please welcome Michael Cohen of Achieve. Thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction. Can you all hear me? Great, okay. And I am really pleased to uh, be here to have an opportunity to talk with you about Common Core and Park and related issues. As soon as I figure out where to put this water, I'll be in good shape. Um, one thing that's really important for you to understand about Achieve uh, that Paul didn't get to, uh, uh, to mention, we are headquartered in Washington, D.C. now. But when we were founded back in 1996, we started out as a Cambridge-based organization. That's because our first president, Bob Schwartz, who many of you know, is a Boston native, and that's where the organization was, was hosted. 
Um, by the time I was hired in 2003, right, in all honesty now, Bob was the only Achieve employee who was in Massachusetts. But to this day, my good friend Dave Driscoll will never let me forget, right, that I moved Achieve from Cambridge to Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, just for the record, I took one job from Massachusetts, uh, and, and that's it. But we do have, in addition to our historical roots in Massachusetts, we actually do have a very long working relationship with, with Massachusetts. I won't go through all the ways in which we've done that, but in every area of work that Achieve has been, been involved on topics of standards, testing, college and career readiness, we've worked in partnership with Massachusetts and are very proud of that uh, relationship, um, mainly because it elevates our importance since Massachusetts uh, is such a leading state in the country. We benefit from that association. Now, I'm here to talk about the Common Core and PARC, and I suspect the first thing to do is to spend a couple of minutes on a very basic question, which is why should people in Massachusetts actually care about the Common Core and PARC? And the reasons for caring really have little to do with standards and testing per se. It has everything to do with the opportunities and choices that your education system provides students or doesn't provide. <coughs> students. It has everything to do with preparing the Commonwealth and, frankly, the country for the future, and it has everything to do with the economy, jobs, and workforce development. In a global knowledge-based economy, education matters more than ever before, and the competition for good jobs is not among communities within states, and it's not even between states. It's a global competition. I should tell you, by the way, and this is a, you, you'll see this thread run throughout my my comments, the recognition that we operate in a global knowledge-based economy is one of the things that has often made governors, business leaders, and many others <coughs> convinced that we need national standards, that if we're competing against other countries and we look at countries that outperform us, virtually all of which have some kind of national consistent expectations for what students need to know and be able to do, the question always come back, comes back to uh, why shouldn't we? Now, this has been tried any number of times in the uh, first Bush administration, in the Clinton administration, uh, in a variety of other ways, uh, and uh, it's never happened. So this is not a simple matter, but just understand that that question of why in the global economy we're operating and we don't have consistent national uh, expectations and standards is one of the undercurrents and part of the context for what's going on in Common Core and, and PARC assessments. Now let me make this a little bit more uh, tied to Massachusetts. Uh, the State Board of Higher Ed uh, estimates that 72% of the jobs in Massachusetts will require some college by 2020, which is not all that far uh, from now. Uh, Board of Ed also predicts a shortfall of 35 to 65,000 college graduates <clears throat> in that same time period. The remediation rate for students who enter community colleges is about 68%. And we know from all kinds of evidence that students who need remediation in their first year uh, uh, are less than half as likely as a better prepared peers to actually earn a degree. They are as precisely as likely as their better prepared peers to pay full college tuition uh, uh, for that and incur debt, but they just don't earn a degree. It's a bad deal for everybody uh, all the way around. If you look at the latest data on the ninth grade cohort of students, students who started ninth grade, right, 33 percent of them total will earn um, college degrees within six years, but only 10 percent of low-income males will, 7 percent of African-American males will, and 6% of low-income Latino males will earn college degrees within six years. So if you think about what it takes to have opportunities and options for young people, right, in today's economy, there's a frighteningly small percentage of our students who start ninth grade who actually end up with the preparation, training, and credentials that will open doors for them. That's what the debate about the Common Core and Park is all about. They're the ones that, 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 that we're focused on. Now, if you look nationally, you see very similar 
picture. Massachusetts, actually, however depressing some of those statistics may be, you're better than most other states uh, are in almost every respect. Uh, the remediation rate uh, nationally is about 30% for first year students, and it's much higher in community colleges. Achieved it, an interesting uh, survey of recent high school graduates. We actually did this twice, in 2004 and in 2014. We uh, found high school graduates, about half of whom were in college or two-year or four-year programs, the other half uh, were in the workforce. And we asked them, now that you're out in the real world, or at least what passes for the real world for someone 18 to 21 years old, uh, uh, do you think you have the skills that you need to succeed in what you're doing? And about 40% said, well, now that you mention it, uh, actually, there are some gaps in my skills. Uh, in 2000, and that figure has not changed over a decade. Uh, we asked college faculty who te teach first-year credit-bearing courses, not the kids who are in remedial programs, about what percentage of the kids you're teaching actually have the skills they need to succeed. They said about 40% of them lack the skills that they need to succeed, and these are the kids in credit-bearing courses. We surveyed employers who hire students out of high school. They, too, estimated that about 40% of the students they hired, or the graduates that they hired, have the skills to do entry-level jobs, but not the skills to advance, right? Lots of other data that I could mention, but the basic picture here is for a long time, right, we've had a system in which you could graduate from high school, right, and not be prepared for what you're going to do uh, next, right? So what does this have to do, again, with the Common Core and Park? It has to do in part with the fact that the poor performance that I described is tied, not entirely, but in part, to the low expectations that we set for high school graduates. Uh, 2004 uh, achieved, uh, completed a study. Uh, Massachusetts was one of the states that participated in it, in that project called the American Diploma Project to identify the literacy and quantitative reasoning skills that students need in order to be ready for college and career. And since most jobs require post-secondary education, the skill set, right, for career prep and college prep look pretty much the same. Uh, we also found when we did, did that research that in almost every state, students can earn a high school diploma without either demonstrating those skills or even demonstrated that they had taken courses that would prepare them for those skills. So for example, uh, we, there was no state back in 2004 that had a set of academic standards that were intentionally aligned, right, with the knowledge and skills that were needed for post-secondary success. They may have been coincidentally aligned with that, right, and Massachusetts probably fits that bill pretty well. You have had the most rigorous standards, but they weren't intentionally aligned with the evidence about what students need to know and be able to do to succeed. Uh, in mathematics, right, we found that the skills that students need are generally found in um, uh, three course sequence of uh, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. Lots of other ways to teach that. Doesn't have to be in traditional courses. Could be integrated into career and tech programs. But that's the skill set that you would, the skills that you would look for. So in 2004, there were only two states that required students to take that three course math sequence in order to earn a diploma. Texas and Arkansas. And we're pretty sure that the State Board of Education had just adopted those requirements about two weeks before we started surveying states. So they were, so for all intents and purposes, nobody required uh, that kind of course taking. Uh, we studied the tests that students have to pass in order to, to uh, earn a diploma. We did a detailed study in a half a dozen states. Massachusetts was one of them. MCAS is about the most rigorous test around at the high school level. And still, to pass that test and similar tests in other states, uh, which they, students generally took in 10th grade, they needed to demonstrate skills that students in high-performing countries learned in 8th grade in order to graduate from high school, right? 8th grade skills, 10th grade tests to earn a diploma at the end of 12th grade. None of that added up to a set of rigorous expectations that demonstrated uh, and required students to actually uh, graduate with the skills that they need in order to succeed. With that problem, Achieve set out to um, uh, uh, challenge states to close that expectations gap, the difference between what students need to know and be able to do and what we demand of them in order to earn a 
uh, high school uh, diploma. And one of the first things we did was to say to the states that signed up to work with us, which by the way, in 2005, we found 13 states that wanted to take on this job. Within a year, there were 35 states that educate 90% of the public school students in the country committed to working on this. So what began as a research finding right, quickly became a national movement on college and career uh, readiness. And the first thing we challenge states to do is make sure that your standards are aligned with demands of college and, and career. We provided a variety of kinds of assistance to states to do that, but the most important fact about that work was that while each state worked on its own, while each state insisted that it have its own standards, right, written by its own educators for its own educators and students, what we found in 2008 when we looked at 15 states that had changed their high school standards, all of a sudden they looked remarkably common. We literally found a common core of expectations across those states. And the reason for that is quite simple. When you ask the question, what's the evidence about what students need to know in order to succeed after high school, that evidence doesn't change from state to state or community to community. So if you have evidence-driven standards, you wind up with common standards. At a time when there was lots of discussion in the country about the need for national standards, once again, right, it mattered that we could demonstrate that states working on their own but with each other, right, could actually arrive at common standards. And so that work, right, that states did provided the intellectual and political foundation for the idea of a state-led effort to create common core standards. <clears throat> and so pretty quickly, um, the National Governors Association, the Council of Chief State School Officers, with some support from ACHIEVE, launched an effort to create common standards. I will not go through the standards in detail now, um, uh, but I am going to show you some test items that will help you see the differences. So here's what you need to know about the standards. First most important thing is when the states came together uh, to, to agree to work together to create common standards. <coughs> Uh, Mitchell Chester and Paul Ravel uh, uh, were at the meeting and they both said, you know, we think the idea of common standards is a really terrific one as long as we in Massachusetts don't have to lower hours. Hear that, folks in Mississippi? As long as we don't have to lower hours, we're all in. And that essentially set a very high bar for uh, the work. And that's why uh, uh, I brought the uh, folks who wrote the standards to Massachusetts three times to meet with curriculum specialists and educators to make sure we understood the needs in Massachusetts. Uh, that's why um, uh, 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 educators from Massachusetts were more deeply involved in the writing process uh, than from elsewhere. Uh, and there's a clear effort to make sure that we attended to the appropriately high expectations in Massachusetts. Now, what did we end up with? Well, we ended up with standards in English language arts and literacy that made some important advances in the standards that had been in place before. Uh, one is in addition to focusing on, um, on uh, reading and writing about literature, uh, there was an increased emphasis on non nonfiction and informational text, which is, turns out largely what the real world demands uh, uh, high school graduates be able to uh, read. There's a tremendous emphasis on explanatory writing as well as uh, speaking. Uh, uh, and the ability to draw evidence from text to make logical, coherent, uh, arguments. Tremendous emphasis on that, K to 12. Um, uh, emphasis on having students read increasingly complex texts as they go from grade to grade, right? Because there was a huge gap between the complexity of texts that students read at the end of high school and the texts that they confront uh, the next year when they go to college, whether it's a two-year or four-year college. So those are the, some of the key changes in the literacy standards. In math, um, uh, all of the international studies uh, show that U.S. standards were basically a mile wide and an inch deep compared to high-performing countries. So the math standards right, have a much sharper focus in each grade on a smaller number of topics that help build a solid foundation before students advance to the next uh, set of, of topics. They go deeper into the content so they can develop a better understanding of it. There is an intentionally clear progression of topics from grade to grade, as opposed to having students learn everything each year, a clear progression so you really do build a solid uh, foundation, and it extends the learning from the previous year. 
And there is an emphasis, a very balanced emphasis on what the mathematicians call procedural fluency. Uh, for regular people, that means kids know their multiplication tables and things like that automatically. Um, uh, with, uh, that um, uh, procedural fluency along with the un understanding the concepts behind it and being able to apply that to real world phenomena. Those are the biggest changes in the standards. You'll see how this plays out in, in a minute. So the standards were developed in 2009 and 2010 for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was race to the top, but I think the most important was the commitment of states independent of the federal involvement. Uh, 46 states in the District of Columbia adopted the Common Core pretty quickly. Uh, and the federal government uh, made available funds that would help states develop new assessments aligned to the standards. Well, why would you want new assessments? For a couple of reasons. One is because you want to measure the standards that you just developed rather than the standards you used to have. Uh, secondly, um, by working together, states could pool their resources, pool their intellectual talent and experience, right, and create tests that could be usable across state lines because the standards were uh, common. Uh, the other thing, you remember I mentioned that current state high school tests right, basically measure eighth grade skills. They do not signal college readiness. There's not a post-secondary system in the country right, that has cared how well students did on their exit exams. Good that they passed it, but their performance otherwise was irrelevant to them. The two assessment consortia, Park and Smart and Balance, set out to create tests that would actually measure college readiness so that post-secondary institutions would actually use that information to make determinations about whether students needed uh, to, to uh, engage in, in remedial courses or could be placed into credit-bearing courses. I have to point out that Richard Friedland chaired for Park, uh, the um, higher ed body that oversaw the college-ready aspect of, of uh, the development of the test. He wisely insisted that if Park was going to create a test that measured college readiness, it would be ever so important to have people associated with higher education leading the effort to determine what college readiness meant. At the same time, Mitchell Chester was co-chairing the governing board for Park. This is another example of the Massachusetts involvement uh, in, in all of this work. Now, let me sort of switch to the uh, test items themselves, because I think that will illustrate for you the difference between MCAS and PARC and demonstrate the increased rigor that PARC brings to the table. Uh, I had no training in this, but I assume this tool is what I'm going to use to advance the slides, right? Just want to check, and the green arrow, I think, is the clue here. Okay, so we're going to start, we're going to look at uh, uh, two sets of items, uh, third grade English language arts uh, from M MCAS and PARC, and then third grade math from MCAS and PARC, and I think that will be enough to give you a flavor of the differences, and it's also about all the time uh, that I'll have to do this. So here's, here's the first item. This is an MCAS uh, item from 2013, right? It requires students to read a passage uh, and then based, answer some multiple choice questions and then based on the passage, um, uh, write an essay explaining uh, why the Statue of Liberty is important to the people of the United States. This is a good test item. This is far more demanding than what's to, what tests in other states um, uh, uh, require. It requires students to read something, to think about it, and to draw some evidence from it and write a coherent logical uh, argument. This is, this is a critical skill. Now let's look at what Park does. <laughs> this is a uh, uh, this is a, a sample performance-based assessment, right? It requires a bit more of students in terms of how they engage with the item. First, uh, students read an excerpt from uh, Eliza's Cherry Trees, uh, Japan's Gift to America. Uh, students are asked to um, uh, which statement following uh, best describes the events in a particular paragraph, which requires them to read the text closely and find information in it so they can answer that uh, question. Uh, and it requires the critical thinking uh, skills necessary to, uh, to think about it. Okay, then they move on to a second part of the same task, the same uh, item set, if you will, right, which is to answer yet another 
uh, question, uh, right? Which sentence from the article best support, supports the answer that they just gave? So it's requiring to come up with the right answer and to find the evidence, right, that, that justifies and supports that answer, right? Then they're given an additional passage to read, an additional text, and they've got some other questions to uh, answer about that. And then they are basically asked to compare the two texts in terms of uh, uh, the fact that they uh, uh, write about famous American people, and the essay is uh, to describe how two characters in these uh, texts face challenges to change uh, something in America. So they are drawing evidence from two different sources, right, and trying to explain a phenomena of how leaders created change, uh, drawing evidence from both texts. This is what we're asking third graders to do. And you can imagine how this provides a foundation as you build on this each year, right, to do the kind of writing uh, and thinking that's necessary in uh, post-secondary education. So that's difference between two third grade uh, reading and writing uh, items. Let's take a look at uh, mathematics. Uh, now again, grade three, first students get a uh, multiple choice uh, item. What's 8,614 8, rounded to the nearest thousand? And they get to pick the answer there, right? Um, but it requires students to show some understanding of rounding and of place value in order right, to know, I mean, they're asked to round to the nearest thousand. If they were rounding to the nearest hundred, they'd have a different answer. So they've got to think about what rounding is and they've got to think about place value in, in this. All right, by the way, the correct answer, in case you didn't know, was D. Um, <laughs> by the way, I know that because my notes tell me uh, 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 that I think I know the correct answer to the next item also, uh, right? They are now asked, right, to, uh, they're still working on the same task, getting at the same concepts. They now, as you can see, are given a different kind of uh, problem, which basically describes the number of seats, right, in three different stadiums, and they're asked. This is a computer-based test, so they sort of click and drag the, um, uh, the text into three boxes and basically order them, arrange them from lowest uh, to highest in terms of the number of, of seats. Not too demanding a task, but an important one. Again, requires them to be able to place this in sequence. Okay, now it gets a little bit more complicated because it really forces them to think a little bit uh, uh, differently, right? They're now asked to compare statements from two students, right? Jeff said I got the same number when I rounded all three numbers of seats in these stadiums. And Sarah said when I round them, I get the same number for two of the stadiums, but a different number for the other stadium, right? Can Jeff and Sarah both be correct? Explain how you know. Now they need to understand rounding and they really need to pay attention to place value, right? And as you will see, well, let me go back, right? The issue here is that, first of all, the answer is Jeff and Sarah can both be correct. It depends on whether they're rounding to the nearest hundred or the nearest thousand, right? The students got to figure that out. Um, that requires conceptual understanding, knowledge of place value, and some real uh, critical thinking uh, skills. Okay. Now they're asking another question that gets at the same thing, right? When rounded to the nearest hundred, the number of seats in the Aces baseball stadium is 9,100. What's the greatest number of seats that could be in the stadium, right? So the nearest, when rounded to the nearest hundred, the number of seats is 9,100. What's the greatest number that uh, there can be? And explain, oops, how you know? Well, you're not going to find out from me <laughs> how you know. Um, right, but that last, I'm back up, okay. okay. In order to answer this question, let me get back to the right one, okay. So in order to answer that question, Right, here's what students need to be able to do. They need to apply what they know about rounding, apply what they know about place value, right? And they need to apply it to a novel question. This is not the same question that they were asked. Now, it turns out the right answer uh, to this is 9,149. 
I see several people mouthing that, so some of you figured this <laughs> out. Right, and, but the reason that that's the right answer is because there, if there were 9,150 or above, then rounding to the nearest 100 would result in 9,200, not 9,100. So th this is not, these are not trick questions, but they do require a deeper understanding of the mathematics, right? Not just getting the right answer in the first item, but being able to carry it through. This is the kind of assessment, this is the kind of expectation for deep understanding, procedural fluency, the ability to do this quickly, and the ability to apply what they've learned to uh, different situations. So uh, PARC, you might think of it this way, MCAS, right? The items that we showed from MCAS are not bad items, right? Um, 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 Jeff Nellhouse, who was in charge of MCAS, until we hired him to be in charge of test development for PARC, we're no dummies. If Massachusetts wanted to make sure they had a test better than MCAS, we hired the guy who was in charge of MCAS, right? And Jeff reminds us that MCAS, MCAS was a really great 20th century test. PARC is a really great 21st century test that speaks to the uh, intellectual demands and needs of, of uh, uh, the future. So I think I'm just about out of time. Let me summarize by saying, uh, uh, you all have a, uh, a lot of work to do in Massachusetts to move students from where you are to these much higher standards. You've got lots of reforms in place in order to do that, professional development, teacher evaluation, a variety of things, right? These, wh whatever tests you use are going to, first of all, help you understand whether you're making progress or not in the, for individual students and for the Commonwealth as a whole, and whatever tests you choose will have powerful feedback on the kind of instruction that occurs. So where you wind up going from here is not an insignificant decision. I know that's one ahead of you, and I hope that this conversation helps you arrive at a, at, at a direction for the state. So thank you very much. Okay, Michael, thank you very much uh, uh, for that provocative opener. And now we're gonna turn to uh, our two uh, commissioners uh, for further commentary before uh, the panel. Uh, let me introduce them uh, uh, both. First, we'll hear from uh, uh, Mitchell Chester, who is the, uh, has been the Massachusetts Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education since May of 2008. Uh, from 2001 through 2008, he worked for the Ohio Department of Education, where he was the second ranking uh, educator, has had a long career in, in uh, education, uh, 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 beginning as a teacher, an assistant principal, and uh, uh, important work in, in uh, Philadelphia. And M Mitchell, each of these gentlemen have been very important partners of the Boston Foundation in, in our education work. In, in Mitchell's case, uh, we have worked very, very closely on the implementation of the landmark uh, 2010 uh, Achievement Gap uh, Act, the very successful implementation in our judgment of that, and uh, he has just been uh, uh, terrific uh, to work with. And I, I might mention, if she's still here, that one of the architects of that bill, former Representative Marty Walls, is with us uh, this morning. Marty, are you here? There she is. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and I also might mention uh, uh, Mitchell's predecessor, uh, someone we also admire greatly and work very closely with, Dave Driscoll, is here. Mr. Driscoll. Mr. Driscoll. Um, so we'll hear from Mitchell first, and then uh, 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 our good friend uh, Richard Freeland, who uh, is the Commissioner of Higher Education for Massachusetts, has announced uh, uh, his intention to uh, leave that post after a very distinguished uh, tenure. And in his case, uh, we worked very closely with uh, Richard on the community college uh, reform and the general effort that he led through the Vision Project to establish uh, transparent standards uh, by which our public higher education system uh, can be measured. And we are very, very pleased to be part of uh, uh, the Vision Project. Uh, of course, before his uh, tenure as uh, Commissioner of Higher Education, which began in 2009, uh, Richard was well known to many of us as the uh, uh, outstanding uh, president of Northeastern University. Uh, for a decade or so uh, where he uh, completely uh, transformed uh, uh, that institution. So starting with Mitchell and then uh, with Richard, uh, let's proceed. Thank you. 
Thanks, Paul. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and, and thanks for the tremendous resource that the Boston Foundation is to, to education. Uh, I know I know more broadly than education, but in my case, I pay attention to, to your work in education. So thanks for hosting this this forum today. And just uh, just to pick up where Mike left off, you know, we're 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 often uh, we're used to, and I don't know how many of you are, are sort of educators or, or immersed in the education field, but in this in this sector, we're used to talking about achievement gaps, and we're used to talking about gaps based on demographic characteristics, whether it's students' economic background, whether it's students' race, ethnicity, language background, disability background. Uh, we're 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 uh, often too used to talking about that because we're, we're 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 too often we end up with a lack of of urgency and sense of urgency around that. What's less frequent is to talk about the gap that Mike Cohen mentioned, which is the expectation gap. It's the gap between what it takes to get through high school and what it takes to be prepared for opportunities after high school. And that's where this conversation squarely falls. Um, it, in Massachusetts, Mike, Mike, Mike uh, cited some national statistics about remediation rates. And I have to find out where you got that 30% rate because the fact of the matter is in Massachusetts, when we track our public school graduates who matriculate in our public campuses, so this does not include graduates who matriculate in, who go to uh, private colleges and universities. Uh, over a third, close to 40%, end up being placed in at least one remedial course. That's Massachusetts public school graduates. And when you, when you break that down and you look at two-year campuses versus four-year campuses, uh, the, the rate is alarming. It is fully two out of three students are graduates. They've met all of our curriculum requirements. They've passed the 10th grade MCAS. Uh, Two-thirds of them who go to our two-year campuses end up uh, being placed in at least one remedial class. And as, as Mike said, and I think Richards uh, knows the data more specifically from Massachusetts, the impact of that is devastating. It's absolutely devastating. And, uh, and, and if you know where, where our students of color tend to go, students from low-income backgrounds, students from our urban districts, more likely to be going to those two-year campuses than the four-year campuses. So uh, this is a, a real, real challenge because if those students left high school knowing that they were headed for remediation, we'd have a different story than the story we're telling today because my my assumption is that very few of those students expected to be placed in remedial coursework. They did what we asked them to do in high school. They, they took our 10th grade test. They passed it. They passed uh, all of their curriculum requirements that their school district laid out for them. Uh, and so they did not have a clear signal that they were not prepared for high school, let alone when they left high school but more importantly, they didn't have that signal earlier in their schooling, as they left middle school to enter high school, as they went from ninth grade to 10th grade. And if they had had a better signal, a more accurate signal about whether or not they're likely on track for what college and employers expect from a high school graduate, they'd be able to do something about that. Their educators would be able to do something about that, teachers and administrators uh, and their their parents and, and they themselves would be able to be proactive in working on upgrading their academic skills. So, so this is a, a critical topic for us in Massachusetts um, and, and I wanted to start there. I, want, I also want to acknowledge uh, a column in the Globe this morning by Joanna Weiss. I don't know if Joanna's in the room or not, but, but uh, I don't know how many of you saw it, but uh, she, she highlights uh, the, the concerns that people are raising about testing and about whether or not we're doing too much testing or whether or not the testing that we're doing is, is helpful or, or, what are, or, uh, or what's the collateral negative uh, damage from, from that kind of testing. And this is an important discussion. It's a discussion that's uh, consuming more and more of the oxygen in the room uh, in discussions that I end up in. 
Uh, it's a discussion that's happening at the national level as Congress is starting to debate the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and what, what kind of testing should be required through that federal legislation. Um, one of the things that, that absolutely uh, intrigues me about PARC, the PARC assessment, is the potential for PARC to be an assessment that's worth teaching to. Right? You saw, you saw a, a, a sample of the kinds of items uh, that PARC is developing and that will be part of the PARC assessment. And they're not the kind of items that if you wanted to drill students to prepare them for a test and you wanted to narrow what they experienced, you, you wouldn't be preparing them for that test. I mean, they need to think, they need to reason, they need to not only have strong literacy and math skills, but they need to know how to apply those. And they, know, they need to know how to encounter and deal with novel situations uh, in that application. And so uh, I'm very, very uh, hopeful that PARC will be that next generation assessment. We've made a commitment in Massachusetts uh, to better understanding the PARC assessment and how it relates to MCAS before we make a decision on whether to sunset MCAS and, and adopt PARC fully as our state assessment. We are the only state, and there's, there's a dozen states who are administering PARC this spring we are the only one of those dozen states uh, that is giving our school districts a choice of administering either the legacy MCAS assessment or the new park test. And we have a, a roughly an even split. In fact, um, it's slightly more than half of the state has elected to administer park. So at the end of this spring, going into the summer, going into the fall, we'll have a very robust comparison of how the new park assessment stacks up against our legacy test, our MCAS test. We'll have tremendous feedback from educators in our schools who, who are watching kids take the park test, watching kids take MCAS. We'll have tremendous feedback from our students because we collect feedback from students at the end of the assessment. It's really neat to watch kids in the online environment. And by, what, by the way, in terms of the online environment, the anxiety of adults far outstrips the anxiety of, of the kids taking the test. I've, I've sat, I, I watched third graders take the test. I was in Paul Dakin's uh, district with, you're gonna hear from Superintendent Dakin from Revere. I watched third graders, I watched fifth graders, I watched eighth graders, I watched, I watched high school students in Boston take the test and uh, none of them had any, any challenges with, the, with working in the online environment but but uh, so, so we'll, have, we'll have very strong information about how the two tests compare, including the standards and the expectations, the performances and, and the, and the uh, standards that are set on those two tests on which to make a decision, and that decision will be made the fall of 2015. This coming fall, we will make a decision based on all of that evidence. Is it time to sunset uh, MCAS? Is PARC? the right next generation assessment for Massachusetts uh, or not, and, and we'll proceed uh, based on that. Um, final comment that, that I'll make, and, and, um, and hopefully this, this uh, tees up uh, Richard Freeland's comments. This effort's been a tremendous uh, marriage partnership between higher ed and the K-12 sector. And, and I'm particularly grateful to uh, my counterpart in higher ed, Richard Freeland, for, for his willingness uh, and interest in embracing this effort with the K-12 sector. We have, a, we have a world where the tests that we, we administer in high school to our students um, as, as, and Mike pointed this out, uh, our, our tests that historically higher ed has paid pretty much zero attention to. So we test in high school, we wanna know how our high schools are doing. Uh, in Massachusetts, as in about half the states in the nation, we have a, a high school exit exam requirement. Students have to pass, pass the 10th grade test as part of their requirements for graduation. Um, but higher ed pays no attention to those tests. 
And what PARC does is it opens up a whole new paradigm potential for us, wherein the tests that students take as they move up the grades and as they move into high school and up through 11th grade are tests that will provide a, an accurate signal for students, for educators, and for higher ed as to whether or not students are, are reaching the kind of level of academic performance that suggests that they really are ready for credit bearing college level work or not. And the neat thing for students and parents and educators is they'll start getting that signal in earlier grades so that they can be proactive in working on, with students on upgrading their skills. And by the time students get to, to 11th grade, they'll either earn or not earn that certification of readiness for credit bearing coursework. And in Massachusetts, through this partnership, we have a commitment from the higher ed sphere that students who earn that credential uh, will, that, that credential will be honored in terms of placement uh, when students show up in campuses, that they don't have to take a different placement test, that they'll know that they're ready for credit bearing courses and that will be used uh, to place them. And I think it's um, just, just opens up a, a tremendous uh, possibility for, for a more integrated, seamless, pathway through the early grades into the middle grades into high school and then ultimately ultimately into higher education so I'm uh, very very committed to uh, to to uh, to this project I've invested a lot of my own time a lot of Massachusetts educators I suspect we have people in the room here who have been very much involved in the development of the assessments the park assessments we have we probably have park fellows any park fellows in the room uh, we have a we have about 50 teachers half in ELA half in math and administrators who uh, who uh, are providing training around the state on on uh, these assessments and uh, and 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 again I think they're, they're going to be a tremendous tool for our educators uh, in terms of their efforts to provide students with engaging 21st century curriculum. So um, I'm pleased to be here and I look forward to my colleague Richard Freeland's comments. By the way, Rich, uh, Paul mentioned that Richard has announced his retirement. I met with the search committee as part of their process for figuring out what qualifications the next commissioner of higher ed should have. And I opened my comments by saying, bring Richard back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mitchell. It, uh, uh, it, it has been a great partnership, and I'm very grateful to Mitchell. This is not about higher ed doing something for K-12. This is about higher ed doing something that higher ed desperately needs to, to happen. So this is uh, our interest in this, the importance of this to higher ed for reasons which I'll talk about in a minute, are every much as great as, uh, as those of the K-12 system. I, too, want to thank the Boston Foundation for uh, sponsoring this, uh, we are faced in Massachusetts with a critically important public policy moment next fall when first the State Board of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education uh, and then the Board of Higher Education are going to have to decide whether or not to substitute these new tests, these PARC tests, for the MCAS tests. That's a decision that the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education is going to have to make and then the Board of Higher Education is going to have to decide whether or not to accept the 11th grade standard in the PARC test uh, as a college-ready standard. This is a once-in-a-century moment for Massachusetts. We are very close to having something we have never had, which is a true K-16 through system. This set of assessments is the key to having a true K through 12, 16 system, meaning a system in which the standards are integrated across the boundary between K-12 and higher ed. We have never had that, and if we don't get it right this time, I suspect it is going to be a very long time before we revisit it. So it is tremendously important that the public of Massachusetts understand this issue, understand what is at stake here, understand the quality of the work that's been 
done here, and I am very hopeful, as is uh, Mitchell, uh, that we get uh, that we get to the right place when we make these decisions. So why is this uh, so important to uh, higher education? Uh, I think there are three things about this whole process that uh, seem to me particularly important from a higher ed point of view. Number one is the 11th grade standard. This process is about uh, including in the MCAS, in the park standards, a, an 11th grade standard, which we in higher education believe is a college-ready standard. Uh, and as Mitchell said, uh, we have said in principle, if we are convinced that that is the case, after all the piloting and testing which is being done right now, if we are convinced that that is the case, then I will recommend to the Board of Higher Education uh, that our policy on placement be that students who meet that standard go directly into credit-bearing instruction and do not have to get retested uh, and do not have to take remediation. Uh, that will transform uh, higher education in a, in a fundamental way. So that, that is the holy grail that we are seeking to get to. The second critical element of this uh, from, uh, from a higher ed point of view, as Mitchell mentioned, is that it isn't just about an 11th grade standard. It's about a, an assessment system that reaches way back to the third grade and starts telling students in the third grade you're on track, you're doing what you ought to be doing in third grade to be where you need to be in fifth grade, to be where you need to be in seventh grade, to be where you need to be in ninth grade, to be where you need for that 11th grade assessment. So there is lots of time, lots of messages to students, to families, to teachers, to principals, to superintendents, uh, to school boards, lots of time to make sure that students are ready for college by the time, or careers by the time they get to completion of high school. So those two things, which we have not had before, a true college-ready 11th grade standard and a development system, a messaging system that everyone uh, working in education can know uh, where students are all along the food chain uh, in terms of getting ready for that 11th grade standard. And then the third thing, which is so important, about all this uh, is that it has fostered a level of collaboration between higher ed and K-12 that goes far, far, far beyond uh, the, the, this focus on a particular test or a particular set of assessments. So we have all across the state on every public campus in Massachusetts, we have campus engagement teams of K-12 folks and higher ed folks talking about their common work talking about how they can collaborate, talking about how they can align their curriculum more. And that work is in process. It is far from done. It has, we have a long way still to go. But these discussions are discussions that we have never had before. And folks in higher ed are tremendously pleased at this opportunity to finally have a context in which to talk with their K through 12 colleagues and understand that we are in a common enterprise and how can we align our work more, uh, more usefully? So uh, this is all about things that are tremendously important to higher ed. Uh, I will simply uh, echo what has already been said and not provide much detail on this because both uh, Michael and Mitchell have said it so, so clearly. Uh, higher ed cannot do what it needs to do unless we change the current system. Uh, the fact that 67%, 65% of our students place into remediation in our community colleges means from everything we know that the likelihood, you now the statistics are that, that uh, one student in four who places into even one remedial class, only one student in four ever completes any kind of college degree. The other three fall by the wayside somewhere. So put together those two statistics, 65% in our community college, which is the largest part of our system, over 100,000 students here, this is larger than, than UMass and the state universities put together in the community colleges. 65% uh, uh, of those students place into remediation, and only one in four of those students are going to get a college degree. Put those two statistics together and, and tell me what kind of trouble Massachusetts is in if we don't. So this is a system that is deeply, deeply broken 
and needs to be fixed. Uh, and the notion of staying where we are, if we reject Park, uh, where are we? The system we have in the system that we would the, the legacy system is a deeply broken system. It is not preparing students for what they need to do. The primary challenge that we have in higher education today is to succeed with more students, is to have a higher percentage of students we enroll graduate. We just published a report, the Third Vision Project report, pointing out that Massachusetts is facing a decline in the number of 18-year-olds, and that decline is going to continue for the next decade. Just at the time when the labor market in Massachusetts, the economy in Massachusetts, needs more college-educated workers. As Michael pointed out, 72% uh, of the jobs in Massachusetts in the near future are going to require a college education. Already today, uh, in the IT field, in the healthcare field, in the finance field, employers are telling us they can't find the number of, of uh, college-educated uh, job seekers to fill the positions that they have. And, in the IT industry, it's, it's almost ridiculous. There, there's a 17 jobs for every college graduate that is coming out uh, of our colleges in IT. And those numbers are going to get worse as the demographics catch up with us uh, and, and the number of college students goes down and therefore the number of college graduates goes down. How can we compensate for that, demographic, for that demographic reality? The answer is we have to succeed with more students. We're losing half the students who enroll. They're falling by the wayside. If we, could, if we could succeed with a higher percentage of those students, we could offset this, democratic, uh, this demographic decline and make life better for the students and strengthen the Massachusetts economy. So that is job one for, uh, higher, for public higher education in Massachusetts, for all of higher education in Massachusetts. And this improved assessment system, which uh, will end the Bermuda Triangle of uh, remediation uh, is absolutely the key to it. So uh, I am passionate about the, the importance of this. We are working very hard. I want to acknowledge uh, in the audience here is Sue Lane, who has been our leader. Sue, would you just stand up for a second? Sue, Sue, Sue Lane. <laughs> Sue Lane has been our leader. Uh, Carlos Santiago is also here who who works with Sue on this. Uh, the three of us are kind of a team leading the, the, the park effort uh, in higher ed. But uh, Sue has been all over the state uh, setting up these campus engagement teams. Work, these park fellows that, uh, that Mitchell mentioned are ambassadors to the schools, uh, to the faculty, helping them understand what this is all about. Uh, we have worked together uh, to craft a common definition for the first time in history through this process of collaboration, we have actually written out a shared definition of what college readiness means. We actually wrote the words together with K-12 and higher education sitting at the table. My board voted that this, yes, this is what college readiness should mean. Mitchell's board voted the same thing. The first time that I know that the two boards voted exactly the same policy within a month of each other. We have a shared uh, definition of college readiness, which is the conceptual foundation for these, for these common standards. Uh, so we are on the edge. We are on the edge of something tremendously important here for our young people, for their lives, for their opportunity, and for the well-being of this state. And uh, I hope we get it right. We're going to be deeply involved through this a process that I mentioned in looking at the results of the testing that is going to take place this spring. We are involved in the national judgment study that's going on to, to set the, the standards, to set where the bar is. So we're going to have lots of opportunity to really take a close look at how this test uh, compares with MCAS. And my job is to make sure that our faculty in higher ed and our administrators in higher ed are deeply involved in all of this all across the state. So when we get to that decision point next fall, everybody knows what's going on, and we make the right decision. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Pauly. I'm a director here at the Boston Foundation. And I'm thrilled to be helping the Boston Foundation kick off its uh, inaugural or centennial year of forums with a forum about a topic that's of great interest 
uh, I think, to all of us, and that is what is taught and what is tested in Massachusetts public schools. The Boston Foundation has not taken any kind of position on the standards or assessments, and so it's helpful to learn alongside with all of you about the Common Core and PARC. Um, before I call the panel up, I just want to add my greetings. Um, there, I see many friends uh, and education luminaries in the room. I did want to note our elected and appointed uh, officials who are in the room. First, I think we have Tim McCarthy from the Boston City Council here. Tim, welcome. Uh, we're also joined by Ron Dorsey, Mayor Walsh's Chief of Education. Welcome. <laughs> Representative Jeff Roy of Franklin is with us. So welcome, Representative Roy. Thank you for being here. And John O'Donnell, the president of Mass Bay Community College. Welcome, as well as our good friend, <laughs> Maura Banta from the Board of Higher Education. Welcome. So here's what I think we know. We know that 46 states in the District of Columbia adopted the Common Core standards over the last four years. Massachusetts is one of those states. We know that consortia of states have come together to develop assessments of those standards together. Our consortia is PARC, and there is an online test that will be administered this spring in little more than half of the Massachusetts school districts in grades K through eight. So what we wanted to do, having read about the controversy here and elsewhere about these standards, is really set up a conversation about what is actually happening. So we heard the national context, and we've heard what's happening in Massachusetts. Elsewhere, you may have read, or perhaps some of you heard on the radio this morning, that there are states that are considering leaving the Common Core. The opposition to the Common Core sounds like it may be growing, and it's diverse opposition. It comes from um, some in the Republican Party, it comes from parent-teacher organizations, and it comes from some teachers' unions. So we'll dig into a little bit more of that as the panel joins me. But I think the conversation has also been linked to how much testing should we do and what kind of testing uh, should we offer. As Mike said, Massachusetts has led the nation in this. In fact, when Massachusetts students compete internationally, our students not only outperform our national peers in the rest of the US, but they, in fact, um, are right up there with the highest performing countries. So why would we mess with something that has worked for so many years? And I, I think the answer that's been offered and, and we'll see as we get deeper into this work over the spring and the fall is that the conversation is changing to one of college and career readiness and what will it take to set up uh, all of our students to be successful in their post-secondary pursuits. And the jury's still out. We'll learn more as we go into the spring and fall, but I hope that we'll learn more this morning with our panel, whom I would invite to join me now on the stage. So immediately, though he hasn't taken a seat yet, I'm just going to start the introductions. Immediately to my right is Dr. Paul Dakin, who is currently in his 14th year as the superintendent of Revere Public Schools. Revere Public Schools serves 7,200 students, 78% of whom live in poverty, 55% speak a first language other than English, and 60% are students of color. Uh, under Dr. Dakin's leadership, uh, Revere Public Schools has expanded learning time at three of its 11 schools, and all 11 schools in Revere are rated as either level one or level two, which is the state's leveling system for high-performing schools. So welcome, Paul. Next to Paul, we have Jane Bamford Lynch, who is sitting in for Katie Novak. Some of you may have seen we had Katie Novak scheduled to come, and she, at the last minute, had a family emergency. And so Jane, who is the district math instructional coach in Cambridge, has graciously agreed to join us and give us the teacher perspective. Uh, Jane spends her time in elementary schools and high schools in Cambridge supporting coaches, teachers, and students in math instruction. She has co-authored a book on math instruction and uh, is also a faculty member at Lesley University, uh, where she's taught for over 27 years. So welcome, Jane, and thank you so much. 
Next to Jane, we have Steve Cazella, who is the president of Mass Inc. Polling Group. Again, those of you paying close attention to the invitation may be expecting to see Jason Williams sitting in that seat. But Jason Williams has fallen to the flu, and so he sent Steve in his place. Steve um, had conducted a poll along with Stanford Children about what principals think about the Common Core. So welcome, Steve, and thank you for being here. And finally, uh, we have Paul Toner, the president of New Voice Strategies, a nonprofit that provides crowdsourcing, a crowdsourcing online platform for educators, parents, and community members to have meaningful discussions about education policy at the local, state, and national level. Paul is also the immediate past president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, which represents the 113,000 members of the Mass uh, Teachers Association. He uh, last year ran for national office with the parent affiliate of the MTA, the National Education Association, and can bring a perspective from that uh, experience about what teachers are thinking across the country. So welcome all. So Jane, I'd like to start with you. Um, Massachusetts adopted the Common Core in 2010, and so that means teachers are teaching these standards. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience looks like and how that might be different from the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks that had been in place previous? Sure. So um, I would like to also acknowledge some of what the previous speakers had talked about this morning. And I would say that I've been a math educator for almost 30 years. And this is a really exciting time to work with teachers. My primary role is, a, is as an elementary coach where I work side by side with other coaches, administrators, teachers, parents, students in the classrooms. And what I am seeing is the biggest shift. It's clear what the expectation is at every grade. So what is expected in first grade grows on what's expected in kindergarten and second grade. And it has really helped conversations in school in schools when for example a first grade teacher is saying what at the end of this year are my students supposed to know and be able to do that builds directly off of what they should have known and been able to do in kindergarten and clear exit standards it was in my opinion in the past not as clear it was a little more vague so that when kids are exiting grades there are to, there are standards that need to be mastered, and um, that's, that's different. Also, as you looked at that example of Park from third grade, which really excites me when I look at that, and one, I wrote down one thing um, that was mentioned this morning, is, is Park an assessment that is worth teaching to? So when I think about that, that's something that I get asked a lot even on the soccer field with my own children, right? They'll say, hey, what do you think about this? You're a math educator. So I don't like thinking about teaching to a test. That's, that's not my belief. It's not when teachers are thinking about teaching. They want to think about educating and preparing students. The park assessment helps us to measure the success students are having. And what I think is exciting about that question, and I represent teachers when I come here today, is it gives us an example of what we are expecting students to be able to do. So when we think about there's in the, um, in the Common Core, there's math practice standards and there's math content standards. And in the practice standards, it really talks about the habits of minds of mathematicians. So we are expecting students in every grade, including pre-K, which is a only in Massachusetts that we have those standards, that students are be able are having to make viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. And I think that that example we gave for third grade is an example of the expectation at all grades. Thank you. Uh, Steve, you're not a principal, but I think you know a lot about what principals think about the Common Core. Could you tell us a little bit about the survey? Yes, we, we did a survey of principals, which was the third one we've done for Stanford Children over the last several years. Um, some, some of you may recall we've published, pub, or Stanford Children rather, has published the results of the last couple. Um, this particular one focused more on Common Core and Park. Um, it was administered last fall online and the, the, the numbers that I'll, that I'll give you today and the d descriptions come from the 285 principals who responded to the survey. Um, so, so generally speaking on both Common Core and Park, principals see each as more demanding than what it's replacing. 
There's some, some that still don't know or see it as equal, but almost nobody, see, uh, which should come as a surprise to no one in this room, see, sees either one, either one as less demanding. We also asked about some specific attributes of each. So how is it doing at the various goals that have been outlined for each, um, for both Park and, and the Common Core? There we found understanding, not surprisingly, much more complete on Common Core than it is on Park, just because Park, Park is still rel relatively newer. Um, but again, on each people, the, the tendency is to see both um, both Park and the Common Core as positive and more demanding than, than, than what it's replacing. The, the area where there's still some uncertainty is, is specifically on Park and specifically on the issue of college and career readiness. There again, I think it's, it's a lack of experience. You know, there, there's uh, principals aren't necessarily feeling experienced or, or like, like they understand fully all the implications of, of Park specifically. So, you know, again, that, that's just something that, that I think will evolve over the next couple of years. Thank you, and we'll dig deeper into that. Paul Dakin, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your experience leading the Revere Public Schools. Um, you've implemented Common Core and piloted PARC. So can you tell us what that's looked like? Uh, we did full PARC testing last year rather than MCAS in three schools. And part of the rationale behind wanting to do that is frankly an equity issue. I didn't want our children and our teachers not to see a test that would come at them uh, new. I want our kids to always see a challenge. And it's like years when I was a coach and an athletic director didn't want me to bring my new team to the state meet. And we eventually agreed that we should go to the state meet because kids have to see and teachers have to see if we look to the education formula how they can be challenged when they look at themselves compared to other districts in the state, other states, and other countries. So there's an equity issue here. Children arrive at my schoolhouse door with an achievement gap. Our job is to close that gap. If I don't show them and their parents and their teachers how different the differentiation of that gap from children that may have more opportunity prior to coming to school, then they don't know what to reach for. And PARC does it better than MCAS does because it brings children and it does bring teachers to higher level applications of thinking skills. It's a more challenging, rigorous test. We saw that. I watched children take it. I interviewed children and I interviewed staff members after. It's more rigorous. The staff was more nervous in the first days than the children. The kids took to it. The staff was afraid as I was and I had articulated to them, I want to look at this closely because one of the things I want to know is the technology divide going to exacerbate the achievement gap. In other words, are we going to leave answers on the paper that because my children in an urban setting don't have a two or three computers or even a computer at home, they won't be able to transfer that knowledge to the keyboard and ultimately to their school. That was a deep worry of mine. It's gone. Watching the kids and watching the staff, we learned that the kids to, took to the technology and that test answer would transcribe itself through technology and activation of the keyboard and the thinking um, to it. So technology is not the problem. It's a tougher test and my teachers know that and the kids know it. And I think a tougher test, like it was when I coached, I wanted my kids to see the kids that could run real fast. That tougher test lets me judge my students, our district, against anyone in the state and preferably in the country as a park exam does. And analogous to this, if you can think on the same parallel, elevating our country's position relative to other countries in achievement. If we don't accept tests that have and require higher order thinking and analyzing and drawing conclusions, much more so than MCAS does, if we don't do that, we're leaving ourselves behind. We're leaving our future behind. Thank you, Paul. Paul Toner, what have you seen around the country as you've traveled and talked to teachers? Sure. Um, well, 
Well, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, I ran for an NEA office. Unfortunately, I wasn't successful, but uh, you know, we'll uh, you know let that be bygones be bygones. But it was a great experience. <laughs> uh, for a year, I traveled around the country, uh, you know, talking to state affiliates, uh, you know, all through New England. I think I made three different trips to California just for one-day speeches and events like this. But, uh, you know, there's two stories. There's a Massachusetts story and there's a national story. Uh, nationally, uh, the real debate is less about standards. I think teachers across the country support high standards. We need to have standards. Uh, and, you know, we can debate, uh, you know, uh, the Common Core standards, you know, and the particulars of it. Like, some people think they're too rigorous. Other people think they're not rigorous enough. I don't know how they can be both, but, you know, we can have that discussion. Uh, I hear the most complaints probably from uh, early educators that think that maybe at the lower grade levels that might be developmentally inappropriate, but then I hear from other early educators that they think it's great to have high standards in the challenge and we need to be, uh, you know, these kids can meet these standards if we work together on it. The big issue is the, the testing, uh, the assessment. And the, the word testing and assessment, they get conflated. Uh, the problem is, is there's all sorts of tests and assessments. There's teacher-based assessments. There's the assessments that students take voluntarily, like SAT, ACT, the uh, AP exams. Then there's the tests that are required by the state. And uh, the point I'd like to make is there's actually only one test required by a state here in Massachusetts at MCAS. All the other assessments and tests, I believe, there's maybe a, a ELL and a couple of other tests, but most tests are actually district driven or teacher driven uh, or parents and uh, individual student driven. So we have to really break that apart and talk about what do we mean by assessment. Uh, the big issue is, is there too much assessment and too much testing and the consequences of that testing? Uh, here in Massachusetts, we worked very hard uh, during my years as president with uh, the commissioner and other folks to make sure that uh, the consequences of assessment were not uh, all about one single test, not the MCAS. For instance, teacher evaluation in Massachusetts, I think, is a comprehensive uh, system that we put in place where testing actually plays a very limited role. It, it helps teachers guide their professional development ultimately. Other states, and this is the national narrative, in other places, 50% of their version of MCAS is the teacher's evaluation. This is why teachers across the country are so upset and some of that debate is actually bleeding into Massachusetts is because a lot of bad practice in other states has led to you know, uh, you know, concern and controversy even here in Massachusetts where uh, I'm glad we're having this discussion because I do believe there's a lot of misinformation out there about how we use assessments and the purpose of assessments and what Common Core is or isn't. Uh, there is a political football out there. Some people think this is federal overreach. Uh, some people actually are currently blaming uh, the President and Secretary Duncan for taking too much credit. Uh, I've, I've heard this on, on the national level that as soon as President Obama mentioned it in his State of the Union address a couple of years ago, all of a sudden Common Core is bad because President Obama was, was supporting it when it was when nobody was really taking credit for it and it was a, uh, a, a ground up movement of both Republican and Democratic governors and chief state school officers, then it was okay. Uh, so there, there is politics involved in it. Um, you know, it, it's hard work. Um, you know, and here in Massachusetts, we do have the benefit uh, of being number one. On many, many indicators, we're number one and we do better uh, in, than a lot of places internationally. So that's probably the biggest debate in Massachusetts. Why are we changing if we're already number one? And I agree with all the prior speakers that it's great that we're number one right now, um, but I don't know how you also complain about too much testing, but then take credit for the fact that we're number one on a bunch of tests. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in, in, in uh, putting all this uh, stock in tests, but we do have to have assessments as a public school parent in Cambridge. I greatly appreciate the work of the teachers in Cambridge and the grades they get, but I, I also have to say that I like getting those MCAS scores uh, at the end of the year just to, you know, sort of as a check and balance. Uh, I don't put too much stock into it, and uh, if, I, if I read them and there's a, a disconnect, then I have a conversation with my kids and my teacher. But, you know, these are the debates that are happening right now. Um, I, I'll just tell you one funny story. When I was campaigning in North Dakota, here's the politics of it. Uh, the president of North Dakota, a good friend of mine, but his members got up and asked me, do I support the new Common Core Science Standards? And I said, yes, I do. And they said, well, then we can't endorse you because here in our state, we're an energy state and it teaches climate, uh, uh, you know, uh, climate change and you know, we're a big energy state and, and we don't like that. So I lost the endorsement in North Dakota because I wasn't willing to deny that there's climate change going on. <laughs>
Well, thank you for not denying that. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to thank you also for raising the controversy. So I'd like to dig in a little bit. Uh, I've read that the Common Core is going to strip creativity from the classroom. It's going to take literature out of the classroom. It's a one-size-fits-all approach. For anyone, uh, Steve, whether you heard this from principals or Jane or Paul, in your experience, is, is that what you're seeing? It's certainly not a fear that, that principals seem to share. Uh, we didn't, uh, uh, I should say we didn't ask about that specifically, but we asked about things like, quote, the overall quality of education students receive. And um, just uh, six or seven, or actually, actually even more than that, d different attributes of um, or ways of rating Common Core and ways of evaluating Common Core. And on all of them, we found a majority saying that they thought that the effect was either very or somewhat positive. The, the range was quite broad as far as how, you know, so, some it was over 90%, some it was closer to 65 or so, but there, was, there, was, there weren't any where people looked at Common Core and said that, that it was going to have a negative impact. So I would tend to doubt that, that, that it would be the same, that, <laughs> that you would see that if you had asked about that issue specifically. Okay. Paul Dakin, did you want to? Respond to that? I, I think um, I think Mike's piece that he put up um, comparing some of the test questions. If any of you have seen MCAS questions and the PARC questions, the PARC questions drive you to a different level of thinking. There's no doubt about that, and that level of thinking transforms itself in the classroom to a degree. Um, I'm a firm believer in student-centered learning, and we have to get to the point where kids are processing their own knowledge and they're learning how to learn. And the depth of PARC and the depth of the common core of treated correctly drives one to change a classroom, to transform the learning environment to a place that's much more exciting and many more things are going on with differentiation happening naturally, with kids discussing and thinking and analyzing more clearly rather than sitting in a lecture absorbing information that was downloaded to them. They truly become deeper thinkers. I'm glad, um, I like sitting next to you. <laughs> I feel that I'm in your classrooms when I'm in our classrooms, which is really exciting, right? So I think the question that you're asking about um, are, teacher, are teachers given the opportunities in their own classroom to teach the standards in the ways that make sense to their students. Because some people may say, here's mandates, this is what we have to teach. Yes, the expectations are clear. But any given teacher has a set of students who you know, the teacher needs to have it make sense for those students. So I'm going to just give a quick little example. Yesterday I was in a workshop with first grade teachers. And one of the first grade standards says, ask for students to evaluate true or false statements. And one of the statements was 4 plus 5 equals 8 plus 1, true or false. So is that different than what the expectations when you were in first grade? Yes, 4 plus 5 equals something was what probably we were asked to do. So when we think about what does that mean to a student, right? What are they being asked to do? So this particular student had an opportunity to write about it. So 4 plus 5 equals 8 plus 1, I know this, this is first grade, because 4 plus 5 equals 9, 8 plus 1 equals 9, 9 equals 9, so 4 plus 5 equals 8 plus 1, and drew all sorts of diagrams to also prove it. This student was given opportunities in the classroom to explore this on a way that made sense. Um, so I think that teachers, as professional educators, are, as you're saying, differentiating for each student, because that's the expectation that they can talk about it, they can think about how other students might be thinking about it, and they're at all different levels. Thank you for mentioning differentiating instruction. I've also read critiques of the Common Core that this, this will be bad for students with disabilities or English language learners. Have you seen that? Have you heard that? Does that appear to be the case for anyone? Our, our ELL students took to, took to the technology pretty well. Um, we have lots of English language learners in our district and they have to take MCAS so they have to take PARC depending on the school they were in last year and you know they ripped into PARC as, in as energetic a way 
probably even more so than they would have to a pencil paper test. And I, I didn't see any interference. As far as students with disabilities go, I think um, things are coming, opening up a wider uh, plane for dealing with some of the accommodations that would be needed. And that, those are learning curves that have to be adjusted. Just as we're looking at a 20-year-old MCAS test and, and saying it doesn't fit anymore, like this suits somewhat, <laughs> we, we need something new. And if we're not creating something new and we're not challenging ourselves to do that, then we're sitting back too much. And it's our fault if we don't make these measures. Okay. Last question for me before I throw it open to the floor, although I have a long list. Um, the last uh, most common critique I've read is that this will usher in uh, a whole lot of extra testing. And, and Paul Toner, you touched on this. But I'm wondering if when we bring in a new test, if that automatically means we'll be doing more testing as we get ready, as we do test prep. Uh, have you seen across the country, Paul Toner, or uh, for our other three panelists in Massachusetts, people either worried about or in fact increasing the amount of testing that's happening in classrooms? Well, the, the major criticism of having mandatory uh, federally required state tests uh, to begin with is that by having those mandated single tests or a handful of tests then drives the instruction in the classroom that because, you know, you mentioned Paul's got level one and two schools. There are other places that have level three, four, and five schools. And, uh, you know, Commissioner Chester can speak uh, more directly to this issue, but there's a whole system in place to determine, you know, how our schools and our states, uh, excuse me, districts are doing and they get ranked, and MCAS and growth is one of those measures. There are other measures, but that is a concern. We, we have districts uh, and schools that are being put into level five, and uh, there are serious consequences for that. Um, you know, we can, that's a, another forum uh, someday. So that's, that's one issue, is because people are now focused on uh, the consequences uh, in that way, that that's uh, driving the issue. And then districts then want to put in more formative assessments of their own to be prepared for the, the serious uh, uh, state uh, test. Um, I, I'm hopeful that if PARC or in other states smarter balance, or you know, the other question is, is whether we have PARC or whether it'll become MCAS 2, because I know that that's another possibility. We know that we're gonna have to change our assessment system to meet the new uh, criteria, the new uh, standards, but whether it's PARC or some new form of MCAS, uh, this, I hope is going to be such a, a better test, and I, I, my understanding of Park is there's a number of possible uh, formative assessments that go along with it that districts can decide to use. They don't have to use them, but they can decide to use them. Um, you know, the, the big issue on, on the testing is, again, the consequences. And I think in Massachusetts, we've been smarter than other states about uh, how those consequences are used. If it's used to help continuously improve, great. But if it's used just to punish and blame, then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I would rather not see more testing at any grade level. I want to see better testing at grade levels. And we can do that. And I think Park does. It, it does pose an interesting political issue because by opening the testing box, you let all, out all these emotions about testing. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be the case that there is going to be more testing in order for people to have negative feelings about testing. You know, so we start talking about PARC and we start talking about changing the tests and it gives an opportunity to vent about all, all of the frustrations that might have to do with testing. So we, we didn't necessarily see it from principals, you know, but we do a lot of education polling and we've seen just, just generalized concern, not, not really specific concern, but generalized concern about is there too much focus on testing. So, you know, it, it's not that, it doesn't have to be the case that there's more in, or, in order to generate concern. I mean, it's a very personal and emotional thing for everybody. I mean, how many of you remember your uh, SAT scores? Okay, that's more than 20, 30, that was 30 years ago. Um, and I still remember them. And, and none of us wants to be judged by our SAT score. So if we have a system in place that's not about that one score once a year, and a system in place that's about helping students reach the higher levels that we all say we want, that's the kind of system we need. So this is a hot topic, so I'll be brief. But um, yes, we don't want to see increase in testing. We want to think about the right test. What I, what I would have to describe as the biggest change that I've seen recently, there's two things. One, there's 
teachers are much more mindful about formative everyday assessing in their classroom. So if a task, if students were learning X, Y, or Z, at the end they may be given an, an exit ticket that says, that asks them to think about what they learned and apply it to a new situation. Kids don't necessarily, we don't want them to think about that as testing, but it is assessing. So no longer are we, and not to say we were ever in a place there, we taught it, therefore they learned it. We need to assess as a teacher so we can make decisions the next day how to meet them at the next step. So that has been a huge shift. I would say we see that much more in classrooms. And the other piece is that the information isn't just for teachers, it's for students. And as young as kindergarten, children need to know what they know. We need to let them know, here's what you know and here's what you're learning so that they can measure their own growth and we're not waiting for tests like PARC to say here's, here's the end result. That's, that's not going to get us where we need to go. That's part of the bigger picture, but that's the biggest shift I would have to say I'm seeing in classrooms in a good way. Thank you. Well, with that, I'm going to invite questions from all of you. I ask one favor from you, my 100 closest friends, and that is that we, um, if you could refrain from statements and speeches and try to restrict yourselves to questions, I think we'll be able to um, get more uh, questions asked and more audience participation. Please be sure to introduce yourself and you're welcome to ask questions of the panel, either of the commissioners or Mike Cohen. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Patty Nolan. Um, increasing the number of Canterbridgeans here, I'm on the Cambridge School Committee and the question I'm not sure to whom it's directed. It has to do not with Common Core, and I think part of the issue around this is people confuse Common Core with PARC. Common Core is the standard, is the standards, PARC is the assessment. Is what's the difference between PARC and an updated MCAS? And the reason is a couple years ago, DESE was in the process of updating MCAS and they right. abandoned that effort. So what so I want to, so the, the question is, how are we gonna validly assess next, this fall, Park and MCAS, when half the districts who chose it, one had a big carrot dangling in front of them, and secondly, right. the MCAS they're comparing to, as everyone acknowledges, is the old thank, MCAS, not thank the updated. You, thank you, Patty. We'll ask Commissioner Chester to comment a little bit about the difference between MCAS and Park and how we'll know um, once we've administered both. Yep, MCAS too. We'll have a very robust um, comparison of the two assessments. I, I don't want to repeat what I said earlier, but, but we'll have a lot of, lot of kids and a lot of teachers uh, and administrators who will have experienced PARC and will have experienced MCAS. We'll also have a lot of data scores and, 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 and so forth. We'll have analyses of how did the, how did the assessments compare, the content they ask, how they ask it, kind of the examples that you saw. So we'll have a, a, a large array of things. There, there, excuse me? There is no MCAS 2 to take. That's right. So we're comparing the MCAS that we have, our legacy test, to the park assessment. And, and so will more to come, it sounds like, and big questions about how we'll measure growth and progress in the midst of learning about uh, our legacy test and the new test. Um, Linda, wait for a mic, please. <laughs> I promise I won't <laughs> I, I appreciated the panel and the, the previous speakers. But I didn't hear anyone talk about the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, Teachers of Engineering, you know, and I'd like to know a little bit about where our national teacher organizations of content stand, Park, Smart and Balance, and uh, Common Core. Okay. I only know what I read, and my understanding was they were both involved, so Mike can talk about that. And, and it, I can tell you both the National Education Association and AFT at the national level support Common Core, however, they are really pushing back on uh, the use and role of testing. Great. Mike, would you like to comment? Uh, with regard to, first of all, the development of the co Common Core standards, uh, 
both NCTM and CTE, right, and a lot of other content-based organizations had an opportunity to participate in the development of the standards, to review and provide feedback. I'm most familiar with the math community where NCTM and some 17 other math content organizations have all endorsed the Common Core. Uh, I think they're all holding back on the assessment uh, issues, but on the Common Core standards, the math community in particular has been right there. Thank you. Yes. Oh, did you want to come? Just a feet on the ground um, teacher piece. We have had um, teachers that were involved in MCAS development and were MCAS readers. Those same teachers, some of them are deeply involved as Park Fellows. And all of those teachers that were close to the MCAS, really close in operations and grading of MCAS, and are close looking at Park, and are now a lot of them coaches in the district math and literacy coaches, see uh, a tremendous value to Park as compared to MCAS. Paul, can you just say one sentence about what a Park Fellow is? Park Fellow are folks that have been trained by the state <coughs> to sort of teacher teaching teachers about what the Park test is going to look like and how it's going to roll out. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, please introduce yourself. I'm here in my capacity as a Boston Public Schools parent, and I feel like this has been very eye-opening. I've been reading a lot about Park, and I wonder whether what kind of parent outreach is happening because I'm frankly, your kid comes home with, from school, they're learning math a different way, they're not correcting spelling. The entire experience feels very different and education is something people feel like they have personal experience with. And then what happens to the kids who are not able to be proficient? Thank you. So we'll, uh, we'll start with Commissioner Chester and then if you would like. Uh, so so um, I'm, I'm gonna encourage the, the uh, local folks to talk about what they're doing to, to uh, inform parents I'm not sure who asked the question, so I'm not doing a good job of making eye contact. But uh, OK. Uh, we do have um, uh, parent-specific material. Some are on the department's website, the, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. But we've distributed them through school districts. So we're hoping they're being distributed there. I know Linda Noonan from the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education is here. And they have a pretty robust communication campaign. I, I don't see Linda right now. Okay. Here, here's Linda. Uh, and, and so the, the, they actually have some materials. So there is there are efforts to provide uh, materials to parents, um, but it, it's an open question as to how well they're being disseminated at this point. Would you like to comment on whether and how uh, in Cambridge or Revere or for anyone else, how things are being communicated to parents? So I think that there's many different levels. We're trying to assess how to best communicate with parents. And we find that the go-to for parents, a lot of parents will go right to the teachers. So we want to educate the teachers so that they're best prepared to answer the questions when parents are asking, as well as offering workshops for parents, mostly on the Common Core standards. Or for us right now, we have a new adoption of a curriculum and how the curriculum is aligned with the Common Core standards. So we would offer those either at building-based, meaning at a particular elementary school or upper school or high school, or district-wide. We're finding the most success building-based as opposed to district, and we're thinking it's because of more familiarity. Like you want to go to a place where your kids are in school. That's how we are. Just from a parent perspective, I'll just say that um, it's been a challenge for me with a nine-year-old uh, uh, in fourth grade because he comes home and he is learning and practicing math in a very different way. Uh, and daddy just wants to show him how to get to the answer quickly. <laughs> and he says, no, my teacher says we have to do it this way. In fact, I, I know my 16-year-old, when she was in school, at some point the teachers stopped sending math homework home because they were tired of the parents messing it up. <laughs> at least this parent. <laughs> uh, we, we have programs for parents, specifically. But it's usually the choir that shows up uh, to get some education you know about what park looks like we've done various things at the school committee level similar to what mike did here to present the idea on how much more complex thinking is involved in some of this work and that that's a good thing for our kids to be exposed to if we're going to close achievement gaps we have to hold our kids to the highest standard that exists and it causes us to have to think more and even the adults see that when they look at the problems mm -hmm. thank you kathy can you tell uh, us who you are? 
<laughs> nice to see you. I'm Kathy Skinner. I'm the policy director for the Mass Teachers Association, but I'm also the regional rep to the NEA Common Core Steering Committee. Um, and I have a question, I think maybe for Paul, because I know Paul Dakin, because I think he's on the MASS board as well. Um, I think that what we're seeing is the, uh, the shift in narrower and deeper in mathematics has not necessarily translated into practice in districts across the state. So we still have, in a lot of places, mile-wide, inch-deep mathematics. Um, and is there a way for us to so sort of systemically work together to make that shift really happen? I, I think the shift will happen quickest when the noise goes away about debating the issue rat rather than getting to the hard work. And I think um, <laughs> teachers are receptive to all kinds of professional development. My teachers are my best asset. And as an urban district, testing like we are, we wouldn't be there without teachers doing hard work. But we also wouldn't be there without them taking a risk and accepting a new challenge that they know is important for our kids who are lower on the socioeconomic scale, who come to the schoolhouse door already with that achievement gap. They've bought into the fact that we've got to get deeper. And that will come in time. And there's implementation dips, as you know, and change comes slow. If we're going to think that we're going to fix this problem in a year, we're wrong. What we have to do is drive and work, understand that it might even be a dip in progress as we're going, but ultimately we're going to be to higher places, and I trust our teachers will get us there. Can I just add on to that, just something brief, that teachers also across the United States needs opportunity for professional development themselves. This is not how they learned the way the expectations. So questions like that third grade question, teachers need to answer that themselves and say, is this the expectation? And play around with it and given that opportunity. So we really do need to support those opportunities for teachers. Yes. Did you have a question? Uh, Dr. Cheryl Denise Holmes Could and please, Dr. Dr. Cheryl Denise Holmes. Good morning. Um, I spent seven years in Bo in uh, Pennsylvania, quasi rural Pennsylvania, uh, with uh, in both public schools and uh, in colleges. Okay, uh, working and attending college. Okay, um, in the area of education, and then I came back to Boston in August, again taking courses in education. I think what you're talking about here is wonderful, but my question is, how do you ensure that at higher education, in the higher education setting, undergrad and graduate level, that there are standards as it relates to curriculum and standards as it relates to outcomes in each course and that, so that the, in the, the what is it, pre-service uh, teachers are prepared with the right mindset and approach to do what it is that needs to be done in the classroom. So the question is, standards in higher ed, particularly in teacher training and preparation to deliver this, uh, these new standards and assessments. Thank you. Um, Richard, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, the, the question is specifically about teacher prep programs, not broader standards in, in higher ed. Standardization in higher ed. Yeah, for in, in, yes. in teacher prep yes. programs. Yes, I, it, it's an excellent question, and it is obviously a, uh, a critical element uh, in this whole equation. Um, ultimately, it is going to be the teachers that we in higher ed are uh, preparing who are going to have to carry out this work. And if they are not thoroughly uh, understanding the new, uh, both the new curricula and the new standards, then uh, uh, the whole the whole system is going to be. Compromise. So the, the question of developing standards for them uh, is critically important, and we are uh, working on that. But I think Sue, it's fair to say, and would welcome a comment here. Uh, we have a, we have a significant. Uh, we're very short on time, so I'd like. People don't have a passion for what they're doing, then it does not come across in the classroom K twelve. Yeah, understood. And that's, and that's, and that's an
Thank you. Uh, understood. Thank you. Um, Jane, I, would you like to comment on that? I just would want to comment about the MTEL general math curriculum test, for example. That's what I'm most familiar with. I teach for Lesley University. I've been teaching there for 30 years, and that has been a game changer. Mm -hmm. That one particular test, it's of a high standard. We are we're in the process of creating a new test, but it does parallel and ask teachers who are going to be elementary teachers to look at student work, to examine the thinking of students and comparing, just like the third grade. Again, I keep going back to that one example because we're all familiar with it, but it's asking for teachers to be mindful and evaluate if they're capable of thinking like this. In, in addition to the academic preparation and the MTEL, uh, I think both unions, uh, and I know I personally have been advocating for a strong, longer pre-practicum period in the classroom uh, to get hands-on experience. Yes. yes, sir. I just want to uh, comment. I'm a pediatrician and associated with the Children's Museum. My name is Michael Yogman, and uh, education doesn't begin at kindergarten with the beginnings of universal pre-K in Boston. Are we beginning to think about coordinating our work uh, with park and with curriculum reform with what happens before kids get to kindergarten. So great question about pre-K, uh, which has been absent from this discussion. Yeah, so, so the short answer is yes. Uh, and, and there's a, a bunch of work, again, I don't know who I'm uh, addressing directly. Uh, but, but there's a, a variety of work that's going on uh, between the pre-K sector and the K-12 sector to, to uh, make sure that those efforts are coordinated, articulated, and aligned. Um, Gary, in the back, if you have a short question, it will have to be it's, our last. It's, it's short, Elizabeth, I promise. Um, Gary Kaplan, JFY Networks. Assuming the park is adopted this fall, how long would the 10th grade MCAS continue to be the high school graduation standard when would it be completely displaced by park? And then when would higher ed discontinue the use of AccuPlacer? Great set of questions. So uh, in regard to the 10th grade uh, MCAS, that will continue to be the graduation requirement for students at least through the class of 2019. Did I get that right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's, that's simply because to do it any earlier would, 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 would re really be unfair to kids who are in the pipeline, right? The class of 2019 will be next year's, I should have figured this out before. <laughs> fresh, fresh, uh, so, I'll so, help you so, on my fingers. So, so, so that decision, that decision, that decision will be made in, in, uh, this, uh, in the 15, 16 school year. Grade eight, maybe? Uh, I have a question on AccuPlace. We've been talking about an 11th grade college ready standard uh, for students who don't meet that standard and therefore uh, may need remediation. AccuPlacer doesn't necessarily go away. We are in the process uh, w within public higher ed of re examining our whole approach Six. to remediation. AccuPlacer hasn't gone away, but it's on the table, and we may move completely away from it based on current pilot testing. Great. Thank you. And with that, I'm afraid we'll have to leave the questions there. But if you're like me, you've learned a lot both from the questions and from the presentations. Before I invite Paul Grogan up for uh, closing comments, please join me in thanking the panel. Well, uh, this is a very uh, complex subject, but uh, I hope that uh, you have found this illuminating, certainly. Uh, I have, and uh, we believe very strongly at the Boston Foundation that open, very well-informed forums like this will get us a better result, uh, whatever that uh, turns out uh, to be. So uh, again, I want to thank uh, Michael for coming up from Washington and back to Boston, our two commissioners for being here with their valuable time, our panelists, and all of you. Clearly keen interest in this subject, and uh, we will stay with it as we go forward. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>